And this is really hard because I want to see your faces and I can't with the light. <laughs> and I'm sure you see a pale lady. I normally wear um, eyeliner maybe twice a year. And I was attempting to do that today, but I thought today's not the day to mess it up. So <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, she already introduced kind of the ministries that I'm in and my family, but I do have four adult children, um, 18, 20, 22, 25. And um, I was a young mom myself, pregnant at 16, and had my first at 17. And so I am still with my husband, my high school sweetheart, praise the Lord, only by the Lord. Um, Cradled in Hope is something that is dear to my heart. And I pray for these, please pray for these young mamas, that they would be ushered, hopefully, into Moms Inspired and be mentored by all of you um, as they get to that point. But um, I'm humbled and grateful to be up here. I, I, like you said, I teach children's ministry, so I'm used to teaching at preschool level, which is you're taught to get below them <laughs> and talk to them. So being up and above you is really intimidating. I don't like it. But, and I'm used to, I was telling the ladies, I'm used to using sign and drawing pictures and dancing and singing. That's my thing. So I'm going to try to be still. I don't know if I'm going to wander, but hopefully I'll get back to the point here. Okay. So Jessica had asked me to speak on hospitality, and as much as my stomach is hurting to be up here doing that, I was stirred as well because that's something the Lord has placed on my heart personally for the past year or so, just in my own personal life, just to be what that means, what that looks like. He's challenged me to be more hospitable and to have um, a greater understanding of what that means biblically. So when she asked, I was like, all right, awesome. I'm not here to teach you anything or to teach you tips or tricks or anything like that. I'm here to say let me come alongside you and let's learn what this means together and then let's try to apply it together. So um, he has shown me that we're not just to be receivers of hospitality, but distributors. And we're distributors of his kindness, his goodness, his generosity, and his grace. I believe that hospitality is at the very heart of God. As um, I've been studying, um, Christ is the example of hospitable. We see it woven throughout the scriptures as well as in the person and work of Jesus, and we'll discover that, hopefully, in some of our time together. Um, I'm going to lick my finger. So there's three words <laughs> that the Lord gave me, because I'm not fancy. I've never done teaching, to tell you the truth, like this. So um, what are three words? I want to be like those teachers that have those magnificent words. But the three things he gave to me was abandon, aim, and apply. I was like, okay. So what he th showed me was he wants me to abandon what I know hospitality to be in my own experience and insecurities of mine. He wants me to aim towards what he has shown us hospitality is, and then he's asking us to apply it, apply it to our lives to where we grow and we grow the others, other people around us. Um, my first, okay, this is going to be a little interactive for five seconds, okay, and I'm literally going to count five. So <laughs> I want you to, to the person next to you, when you hear the word hospitality, I want you to tell them what's the first thing that comes to your mind, person or thing. Ready? Go. Five, four, three, two, one. We're done. Okay. That's what we do in preschool too. So we're done. Okay. I don't know if that was surprising to you, that first word that popped into your mind. The first thing that pops into my mind is a person. I have a lifelong friend. Her name is Sonia. And she comes up in all of my testimony and history. She brought me to the Lord. She is just like Ah, in my eyes. She's the same age as me. We're both pregnant teens. But <laughs> she loves the Lord, and her heart matches what she displays. But she, her hospitality is amazing. She has all the fancy things. She like, has a whole garage of, like, these plate stands. And some of you are gifted and have all those things that make just everything look beautiful. She could throw something together. Beautiful. So because of that, growing up alongside her, she was that friend that we grew up and raised our kids together. But comparison... <laughs> And through my insecurities of comparison, my heart felt very inadequate in the field of hospitality. So I was like, you know, Lord, maybe that's just not for me. I'm not gifted there. Because when I see hospitality, I see her. And I'm not her in any way. We're very different, but we're very the same, too. Um, so I was 24 with four kids um, under the age of six. Had all my kids by 24. I was married. I was a young mom. And I thought, these things are stacked against me. I can't have people over, right? I have too many little ones, four, so that's enough, right? Home that never seemed clean enough or big enough. I didn't have free time. It was limited. I was a very sleep scheduled person with my kids. Um, I had a less than perfect appearance, as you can tell, my home and myself. 
Not a great cook, nor do I even like to cook. <laughs> um, I had no fancy table setting. I literally had like a four-seater table. So I thought, okay, well, I'm just meant to go over to other people's houses and be blessed, you know? <laughs> Not really meant for them to come here. <laughs> so, but it's funny because growing up, my kids had a great community. I have friends who had tons of kids. And honestly, if they were to all to come to my house, it's because I was selfish. And I was like, well, I want my kids to be occupied with their toys and their things so I can actually like hang out with my friends. So that was like my hospitality. But as I got older, the excuse of too many kids was kind of no longer valid, right? They were all old enough to really help <laughs> and entertain. Um, but still, even to this day, I have to fight the doubts and the things that, why can't I have people over? Well, because time. Again, I don't have the fancy table setting, um, a clean house. I mean, it's clean, but there's literally right now eight of us living there. Great tasting food. I still don't like to cook. My husband's the cook. Um, cute decor. I'm telling you, if you come to my house, now this is no, I'm a grandma, remind you. So my kids used to say, Mom, this house is like a grandma's house. And I'm like, oh, because all my stuff is hand-me-downs and thrift store stuff. And now that I'm a grandma, I'm like, that's insulting, because what does that mean? But anyway, um, lively entertainment. I have to say that if you come to my house, I'm like, have my stack of games ready, because I'm so nervous, like a deck of cards and at least dice, the very least. Because if anybody knows me, I do not like awkward silence. Like, it's my worst nightmare. So um, I remember meeting with a young lady. I wanted to meet with her just to get to know her. Again, my insides are like, Ugh, but... My heart is like, I want to know her. So I'm like, let's go have coffee. But the whole time I'm like nervous and sweating. And I'm like, I brought my game sequence. I don't know if you know that game. But I brought it with me to the coffee shop. And I sat down. I set it up. And I'm like, listen, I want to get to know you. You're so sweet. And I just want to know your heart. And then, but I brought this game in case we run out of things to say or we just get bored with each other. I don't know. At the very least, we could play a game. So she laughed at me. We never played the game. We did have a wonderful conversation. So it was great. So... All of that to say, I had so many excuses. And I want you to think, what are some of your excuses? Um, the list could go on and on. And even though I so desire to bring people in my home, I love people. <laughs> to sit and to hear them and to support them and to know them and to come alongside them. But how could I invite them over, I thought, when I was lacking in so many areas? At least this is how truly I feel. Um, do any of you feel that way? I had this ongoing battle in my mind, my mind is oh, my mind, in my mind for years of what the Lord was calling me to do and what I felt I was able to do. And that is a whole teaching in and of itself that we're not going to go into. So um, the Lord showed me whether I was capable or ready that he was going to use my home in ways I wasn't prepared for. Thank goodness, though, because I'm one of those people, honestly, if I was aware, I won't do it. Like, if you ever want to come visit me, just show up, because if we ever try to plan a date, it probably is going to be a long time coming. So just show up. Don't let me know. I'm the only one who thinks, I am the one who thinks too much, which normally leads to doubt and fear, but it also gives me a deep dependency on the Lord, because in and of myself, I am totally content just being at home by myself, reading a book <laughs> in my comfort zone. But my heart and my soul desire community and growth and genuine relationships. So six to seven years ago, we moved here to Temecula from the town of Apple Valley. I don't know if you know where that's at, but that's where I'm from. <laughs> and Apple Valley um, was a great place, but when we moved here, we're like, okay, let's find... Um, we moved here for several reasons, but... Um, one, you don't, we didn't know anybody. We had no family. We had no church. We had left our church of 11 years. We didn't know what we were doing. So what we had to do was we had to step out and meet people in everyday places and in mundane tasks. And the Lord showed me that he's in those everyday places and mundane tasks. So don't neglect that. Um, the Lord planted us. We got a house, luckily, like right down the street from the Bible college, which was kind of cool. You could literally like ride your bike I couldn't, but someone that rides bikes could literally do it. <laughs> Riding a bike is harder than it looks. So, um, but we, so my son was taking a class at a semester at the Bible College. He was 19 at the time, and we had friends that we had grown up with in the high desert who were sending now their kids to Bible College. So some kids we knew and some kids we didn't, and it's just amazing. The first year there, 
tons of kids were just coming over. I mean, we literally didn't even have a kitchen table at that point. We had like one couch. And they would just come over. They would just plop and sit down. They would want to eat. Again, I didn't know what to feed them, but somehow we did. Um, but over time, there some would be strangers. Some would be kids that we would know. And I, little did I know, looking hindsight, that was hospitality. I just didn't realize it. Thank goodness. The Lord keeps me ignorant in so many ways. But they would try... Um, so many years, they would come year after year, semester after semester. So like some of these kids, I call them kids, they're adults, but um, would come over for like three years they were coming over. They would travel with us. They would lounge around with us. They would take naps on our couch. They would do laundry at our house. They even like would go and with us to celebrate holidays with family. <laughs> they would come to my kids' uh, sports games. I think one time I came home, they were in my home cleaning it. Like I came home to a clean house one time, but it was awesome. So these young adults became part of our family, and at this time, I couldn't understand why they would want to hang around our less than exciting house and our less than exciting family, of course, I thought. But at one point early on, like I said, we didn't even have much for them to even do or see or sit, right? But after some time, I realized they didn't want anything fancy. They just wanted an open door and an open heart, a place to belong, a place to just be silent, a place they could find rest, a place that they could be cared for. The Lord showed me that hospitality wasn't what I thought it was. It was so much more. They made their way into our homes and our hearts, and I love those kids. Even to this day, it's so neat to follow them. Like, they're married and having babies and just living this life, and I just thought, man, I remember just nights on the couch talking about the struggles and all the things they were facing, so it's awesome to see where they're at. Um, I'm humbled by the fact that they let me be a small moment, a small memory in their path, and that the Lord allowed them to be those moments in our path. But the Lord... Since then, the Lord had expectedly and unexpectedly used our home for mission um, and ministry meetings, for gatherings, for shelter, for people just passing by. People would send their kids, oh, can they stay a night or two at your house because they're working that way? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so people would stay over. We had one young man that stayed two months with us and um, got to know the Lord and baptized. And so the Lord just is bringing them unexpectedly and expectedly. But the Lord showed me that there is so much more to this thing that we call hospitality. It's not something we do, but it's something we are. We're to be hospitable. And so let me give you some statistics, which made me really sad, and maybe hopefully will prompt your heart as to why we need to reach out to those who are in our reach. Um, in 2018, a study found that almost half of all Americans feel alone. Um, according to a study, 46% of Americans report feeling lonely sometimes or always. 47% report feeling left out sometimes or always. A little less, 43% report feeling isolated from others. And the same number report feeling they lack companionship and their relationships lack real meaning. 27% of Americans rarely or never feel like they, there are people who understand them. Only 27% feel they belong to a group of friends. One in five Americans rarely, if ever, feel close to others, and only about half, 53%, report having meaningful, in-person, social interactions with friends or family on a daily basis. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. And I remember being in that place, and I know people who are in that place. And loneliness is the thing that comes up the most. Even no matter what season or what ministry it is, that is the word that seems to ring true in most people's lives. And why is that? <laughs> the statistics break my heart as I know they break the Lord's. Are we so consumed with our lives that we no longer seek others out or are even available for others to seek us out? When... We say later, that cannot be so because we're not promised later. They're not promised later. We need to ask the Lord to give us a sense of urgency. We need to make the gospel known in both word and deed to a dying and obviously very lonely, lonely world. Each season of life, of course, brings its own distractions, right? Hindrances, struggles, we all get that. But the seasons, circumstances, and situations that surround us are never of greater value than the Lord, 
than who the Lord has allowed within our reach, within our span. There is never going to be a perfect season, ladies. <laughs> I've now lived through certain seasons of life, and none of them were perfect. But we have to be ready. We aren't asked to live a Christian life just when it's easy and convenient or comfortable. We are asked to live a life surrendered to his purpose, his glory, and his will. We are called to make disciples. We are called to go and make disciples. The heart of God has to be, has to be reflected in how we love others because of how he loves us. And how we love and receive others must be a reflection of the gospel. So two, <laughs> aim. So now that I put back, okay, what, Lord, I thought hospitality was and what I thought hospitality wasn't, now I'm going to aim, Lord, to what biblical hospitality, what you say being hospitable looks like. And according to Strong's Concordance, I'm going to get a little funky on you, but it's phoonixia, which means <laughs> hospitality literally means love of strangers, love to strangers. Did you know that? It wasn't all the fancy stuff all along. It was about people and not about the things. It was about our heart motive towards people. So hospitable in the concordance says receiving and entertaining strangers with kindness. It's funny that the, I didn't even know they were going to speak on kindness as far as Gina um, gave us a little devotion on that. But kindness is a big part of it. With kindness and without reward, kind to strangers and guests, inviting to strangers, offering kind reception. Hospitality is the act of practice or receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. One more definition for you. Hospitality is defined in the New King James Version as this. The welcoming and fellowshipping with believers and non-believers believers, out of truth and love for Jesus Christ so that they may see Christ more clearly. When we invite people into our home, when we invite people to the park, when we invite people to have coffee, this is what our goal and desire is when we're hospitable, so that they may see Christ more clearly. Do those definitions take you by surprise? They took me by surprise. Again, I'm in this with you. I'm learning what this means, and I really want to have this heart towards hospitality. We show hospitality not to put ourselves, our homes, or even our gifts on display, but so that Christ may be seen more clearly. Hospitality is a character trait. It is Christ on display in us. Being hospitable is, again, not what we do. It's what we are. This quote comes from a book, which I can't... Um, recommend because I haven't read the whole thing through, but I plan on reading the whole thing through <laughs> because, again, I am still learning what this means. But it had some awesome nuggets then, and I'll be quoting some things from the book. It says, the world could use more ordinary Christians opening their ordinary lives so others can see what life in light of the gospel looks like. Hospitality can happen outside the home, inside the home, wherever the Lord gives you a place to stretch out an arm, to lend an ear, to speak a truth, comfort a weary heart, provide for a need. That is where hospitality is happening. Hospital hospitality is needed and dying, I say, because of social media. And I know that we can blame that on a lot of things, but we need to get back to holding someone's hand. We need to get back to seeing the expression in their face. We need to get back to being able to give someone a hug. We need to get back to having those conversations face to face. It's so important. We don't want that to be a dying thing because our children are watching and we want our children to grow up knowing that people have feelings, they have touch, they have sound, they have expression. And so we want to make sure that as we're going to go on to the apply part of this, what that looks like for you, but what that looks like for your children as well, because they're watching. And what becomes habit in your home will become habit for them. So four things that stand out based on these definitions. So as I was looking at that definition, receiving and entertaining strangers, while we are to fellowship and commune with believers, we must not neglect the very definition of hospitality, love of strangers. That freaks me out because, again, I'm very, I love people and I like to step out and do scary things, but at the same time, I'm dying inside. I die inside every time I have to meet someone new. You have no idea. But the stranger always ends up becoming a friend. And so I'm always walk away and leave that interaction like, 
thank you, Lord. Like, I am so much more blessed by the fact that they allowed me to hear their heart, that they allowed me to step into their space. Just like this table over here, you guys are like, awesome. I would love to get to know you a little more. <laughs> but that they allow you to know some deep parts of your hearts, of their hearts. And so this is a testimony of the heart of God. You know, if we want to put on Christ, then who is Christ and who is Christ in us? While entertaining angels, it says in Hebrews 13, 1 through 2, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters, and don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And we've always heard that, but as I was sitting with that scripture, I thought, okay, entertaining angels, wow, right? I mean, that would be crazy. But you know what's more crazy is entertaining someone who is the very image of God, like, that's more crazy. Like, we should be more amazed at that. That I get to have you over someone who is the very image of God. And so, do we tend to gather with those that we're only comfortable with? Or maybe those who aren't so complicated, aren't so messy, have so many problems? I mean, what? Do, <laughs> who do we surround ourselves with? Because is it about us? Or is it about them seeing Christ in us. Um, Jesus met with tax collectors, fornicators, adulterers, lepers, least and likely least popular people. He met them where they were at, but after the time spent with them, they would never be the same. As we read through scriptures, especially teaching the littles, I'm always like, the Lord went and had another meal with them. The Lord was like, Zacchaeus, come down, and he went to the house and had a meal, and there were so many times where the Lord was like, I'm just going to sit, have a meal, and get to know you, and when he left, they would be changed. When people come in our home, do they feel changed? When people come in our home, do they know, like, ah, that's the heart of Christ in you? So are we ready to receive at any moment, any time, any person? I would say no, but put that in your mind and be ready to receive any moment, any time, any person. So the next part of that was um, receiving and entertaining strangers with kindness and without reward. So let's focus, first of all, on the without reward part, right? Not wanting to receive affirmation, thank yous, or praise do we bring people into our home. Sometimes we bring them in wanting something in return. And it says hospitality is a sacrificial act of obedience, right? It takes time. It does take resource. It takes sacrificing our comfort that we may reap nothing more than it just being an act of worship to the Lord and a love for those he loves. But what could be more of a reward than that? An opportunity to make it as an offering and worship to the Lord. A chance to worship the Lord clothed in humility, mercy, and grace. What a beautiful thing that is. That is hospitality. Hebrews 13, 16 says, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. In Luke 14, 7 through 14, it's a parable of guests. And I'm not going to go into the long scriptures, but it does say in verse 8, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you will both come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited to go and, re go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have the honor and sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's a next portion to the scripture, but this is the first part is going into, okay, how we're to be when we enter someone's home. The 12 through 14 is how we're to be when we invite someone into our home. And both, as I was reading them, the main attribute is humility. When you go into someone's house, home, you need to be in a place of humility. When you are inviting others, you need to be in a place of humility. It says in verse 12 through 14, and he also went to say, the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, right? Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of righteous, of the righteous. So when you 
are practicing hospitality, are you looking for something in return? And I was like, well, not really. Like, I don't. But as I sat with that, I thought, well, am I looking for a friend? Maybe a forever friend? Like, if I invite you, we can, we'll become really good friends. <laughs> am I looking for a reciprocated offer? Like, hey, I made you a meal. You make me a meal. Are we looking at a chance to shine? Like, look what I did. Look who I had over. <laughs> you know, those are some things and some reasons why we could be hospitable. Or are you acting with the attitude of humility, seeking nothing in return? I wasn't going to share this, but I have a son with special needs. He's 22. And he has two or three select people from the church, young adults, that will just pick him up and take him to the farmer's market, take him to a movie, take him to lunch. My David has nothing to offer back, <laughs> except talking your ear off. He's a talker. And there, I, when I think of this, I think of them. Like, I don't even think they know that they're being hospitable and have the heart of hospitality, that they're giving and pouring out and loving on my son and showing Christ when they absolutely are not getting anything in return. And so that blesses my heart. I know it blesses the Lord's heart. It blesses David's heart. And I hope that the Lord blesses their heart because of that. The third point is with kindness and general generous liberality. It says... Um, the act or practice of receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. Galatians 5.22, we're going into the kindness thing. A lot of you guys were praying for kindness. <laughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? Against such things there is no law. We see that kindness is Spirit-produced. You can give generously outwardly, but inwardly kindness must dwell. Kindness is... It said, this quote was so beautiful, and I don't know who quoted it, so sorry. Kindness is love's conduct. It's how love behaves itself. And I thought that is a sweet way to look at something inward. It's not just the outward showing. It's what's happening inwardly. Generosity is showing a readiness to give more of something. Liberality is the willingness to give or share freely. So when you put that together, that is a lot of giving, sharing, <laughs> willingly, freely, right? And how many of us are just holding on to all our things, our time, our resources, our space, our comfort, all those things. And the Lord's saying, where's your generous liberality here? Where's your kindness? First Peter 4, 8 through 9 says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. How many of you have, okay, you've opened your heart, you're stepping out, you're going to fight, invite people over, and then you're a crazy mad woman trying to prepare for that. I am. My kids will tell you when I start going crazy cleaning, they're like, who's coming over? It came to the point where like, no one's coming over. I just want to clean house. Like, I really do enjoy a clean house. But there was times where I would just be crazy lady. In the meantime, I'm like kicking my kids and I'm having the attitude and I'm breaking down and my marriage is gonna fall apart. And then it's like, ah, we're, we're having these people over. And it shouldn't be that way. It's not about all of that. It's about the guests who will be coming. Do we even take a moment to pray over the guests that would be coming? Do we take a moment just to pause and thank the Lord that we have a home we can open to? I mean, so many things we worry about do not have eternal value. And God is saying, what is eternal is what I want you to focus on here. And so the without grumbling was like, oh, obviously people do it. The Lord wouldn't have put in there if he knew our heart wasn't going to grumble, right? So don't murmur and complain if you're going to have people over about the crumbs left on the floor, the toys left out, the, maybe the stain on the carpet, or the pile of dishes that are in the sink now that everyone's gone and you have like church the next morning, you got a big mess Saturday night, right? Don't just do what is hospitable. Ask the Lord to help you become a person who is hospitable, to give you the heart of hospitality. When we have people over, I want you to evaluate what is your heart posture? What is your heart attitude? So many have given out of portion rather than out of plenty. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it seems like in the Bible, two examples, there's many, but like with the fish and the loaves, you know, they didn't have abundance, but they gave. The lady, the widow who had her last um, glass of water because there was a drought in the land maybe and just had a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour, and she was going to make bread, and they're like, feed the prophet that's coming. She gave the last of what she had, trusting the Lord would provide. There's so many times where the Lord's saying, you don't have to be in abundance to be able to have the heart of hospitality. You just have to have the heart of generosity. You have to be ready to give your last. That is, again, that sacrificial part of it. Don't think, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, no gentlemen here, ladies, <laughs> don't think 
that because you have little, you have nothing to give. Think about the lady with the mites. I mean, she had little to give, but she gave it all. And I want to be one who's like, Lord, everything I have, you've given to me. Even my children, you've given to me. Nothing you've given to me is meant to be a distraction from what you want in my life, for what you want to do in other people's lives, right? It's a blessing. Use it. Rarely do you see the obedience, again, to practice hospitality out of abundance, but rather out of the ration of the last portions in faith. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Money doesn't define hospitality. Generosity does. And the last part of that, practice hospitality. It means, what's the big word in there to me that stood out? Practice, <laughs> right? It, that means it probably doesn't come naturally. It probably is something we have to exercise, something we have to do, something that has to be learned, hence why I am learning this. <laughs> it means, practice means to pursue, to go after, to keep doing regular, persistently. Can you say that true in your life? Can you say and think back over the past year how many people you've invited into your home? And not just friends, but maybe those who you've met for the first time. Maybe those who you've just met once and wanted to ask to come over. Just think about who's come in and through your home over the past year. That shouldn't be how it is. The Lord says we need to practice it. We need to pursue it. We need to do, be regular and persistent in it. Romans 12, 13 says, when God's people are in need... Be ready to help them always to be eager to practice hospitality. Would this describe again your heart, your attitude, and pursuit towards loving others? It is easy and so easy to neglect the area of obedience. I mean, to always be eager (laughs) is a big calling. Can't say that that's honestly my priority in life, but we need to be ready, right? Practice means it's something, again, that doesn't come naturally. It means that even if it does, it's something that needs to be refined, right? I know how to play softball, but if I don't practice, I'm not going to refine it. I'm not going to get better at it. If you've never played before, then you definitely need to practice, and it's a good start, right? So you can start going towards that. But practice builds up muscle memory, and pretty soon those muscles will just naturally Oh, I meet someone, you want to come over for dinner? Oh, you want to go have coffee? Oh, it just will become a natural part of who you are because it's Christ in you and it's who Christ is. So the greatest act, we're going to go down because I didn't even think I would go 20 minutes and it's flying. Hospitality is reflected in the Old and New Testament. Now we're going to get, what is the biblical part of this? It's hospitality is reflected. It gives rest in Genesis 18 through 2 through 8. You can go through all throughout scriptures and find what hosp- where hospitality is. Um, it feeds in Matthew 14, 15. It communes in Luke 24, 13. It shelters in Acts 16. And the greatest act was by God through the person of Jesus Christ. We were once strangers that were welcomed in, given a he- heavenly home. 2 Corinthians 5.1. He clothed us with garments of salvation and a robe of righteousness, Isaiah 61.10. He satisfies our hunger and thirst, John 6.35. We are given shelter in the shield and safety of his faithfulness, Psalm 91.4. He shows us hospitality not because of our goodness, but because of his glory and grace. That speaks a lot because when we're inviting someone over, It's not because we're good. It's not because they're good. It's not because they're the most pleasant to look at, the most pleasant to be around, the most, whatever it is. It's because of his goodness and grace that we are to be that way. For by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Romans 3, 24, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Another scripture, quote from this book, is throughout the saga of history, God consistently initiates relationship. He is a gracious host, constantly welcoming welcoming in wayward sinners who deserve his wrath, a people whose only hope is that he would show them undeserved hospitality. To me, that's amazing that where we were at, no way should I have been able to come to the Lord and commune with him with who I was and what I did and how far I was from him, that he welcomed me in and called me child. If he had not had the outstretched arm, where would I be? And so we need to outstretch our arms to those who may not be the most likely that we would stretch them out to, if that makes sense. Another quote says, 
If we were, if there has been a stranger in need, someone completely excluded and hopeless, fully dependent on the grace of another, that is us. We were out in the cold, victim, victims of our own folly, freezing to death from the coldness in our own hearts. And all throughout history, God opens the door, rescues us, and welcomes us back into relationship through sheer inexplic inexplicable grace. We were the sojourners, strangers in the land of Egypt, and yet God says we are now members of his household, and he has welcomed us in. We're going to go into the last part, the apply. Two minutes, okay? <laughs> the apply. So now that we know this, and this is just a little taste of who God is and a little taste of what he has to say on this, and I hope that I didn't like get you wandering in a land far away that is not understandable, but if you leave with anything, leave with this, is that put on Christ and be Christ to those around you. Um, now that we know the true definition and depth of hospitality and what that is and what that looks like in our life, I hope that you're stirred to kind of question what that looks like in your life, what that is going to look like in your home. How does that take place in the season and situation you're in? In the situation I'm in, my kids are all older now. It has gotten easier. It doesn't mean I don't have the same fears. It just means it's gotten easier. But at the same time, when I had little ones, what a blessing that would have been to be able to show that to my kids. What a blessing it would have been for them to partake in being part of that hospitable family. We want our kids to know what it's like to sacrifice and to know that that sacrifice is worth it, that those people are worth it. It is good for children to watch their parents living the gospel in regular nightly table fellowship. They watch you warmly embrace neighbors who think differently than you do, and they hope that maybe, just maybe, their secrets are safe with you. They watch you live gospel, they watch you live gospel fluency, handle conflict, make sacrifices, and see unbelievers come to Christ at the kitchen table. The children in the neighborhood catch on to what's going on in your home, and soon they start coming over to dinner, asking questions, opening their hearts and family devotions, and coming to church. These kids start to bring their siblings or their parents. Your children behold that Jesus really is king and really is alive, and that he isn't just some prop you pull out on Sunday morning or for youth group. Some ways we can show our kids and involve them. These are just simple, and you guys go home and think of some ways that you can involve them. But maybe it, practice at home having dinner, sitting at a table. That is kind of rare, <laughs> honestly. People sit on couches in all different places. Practice sitting at a table with your kids. The things that you practice when you don't have guests over are the things that will happen when you do have guests over. So practice sitting at the dinner table. Practice having conversations with them. I remember always asking my kids, what was the best part of your day? What was the worst part of your day? What day would, what would you like to happen tomorrow? So we would go around the table and just answer those questions. Um, let them have a part in the cleanup and in the setup of the table. Have them pray out loud over dinner and for people. Because when people come over, that will be natural. It, that when people come over, they'll pray for them. Or it'll be natural that, the, oh, people are coming over, we'll serve them. Or, oh, they're coming over, i got to share my toys with them. It'll be natural for them to have that inclination towards hospitality. But it takes practice. Don't expect it just to happen because you invite a family over one day. <laughs> right? What we do at home is what will be reflected in the rest of their lives. Um, it will prepare them for your guests. Yes, it will look differently for each one of us, but as we put on Christ, we put on the attribute of hospitality. We don't have to be elaborate. We just need to be intentional and make ourselves available. Someone said they have paper plate Sunday meals. They have a meal ready for Sunday, and they have paper plates. Nothing fancy, so that as they walk out of these doors, if they meet someone, if the Lord puts it on their heart to invite someone over, it's not a burden. They're ready to go. They got their paper goods, and they got a meal planned. <laughs> and I thought, how awesome is that? That is my desire. That's where I'm challenging myself is Sunday dinners with new people. And that is something that the Lord has put on my heart. And keep me accountable. Ask me when you see me. <laughs> or maybe come over, one of some of you. So um, the gospel can be shown and shared through an after-school pickup, through a play date, through a PTA meeting, through a parent-teacher conference, through walking your dog, through a picnic at the park, through a t-ball game, wherever the Lord has allowed you to be, see it as an opportunity to reflect who he is. We're going to end with this, and this is um, 
a, a quote by John Piper, and it says, therefore, when we practice hospitality, here's what happens. We experience the refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality rather than being self-decaying cul-de-sacs. The joy of receiving God's hospitality decays and dies if it doesn't flourish in our own hospitality to others. Or here is another way to put it. When we practice hospitality, we experience the thrill of feeling God's power conquer our fears and our stinginess and all the psychological gravity of our own self-centeredness. <laughs> And there are few joys, if any, greater than the joy of experiencing the liberating power of God's hospitality, making us a new and radically different kind of people who love to reflect the glory of his grace as we extend it to other, others in all kinds of hospitality. Don't ever underestimate the power of your living room as a launching pad for new life and hope and ministry and mission.